Hi, I'm Melanie Tanilian, and I'm the director of the Center for Armenian Studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And before we begin, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And of course, thank our program specialist, Naira Tumanian, for organizing this webinar and of course, orchestrating this event from the back end. As always, uh, nothing would happen without her. Um, as you all know by now, you can submit your question to our speaker via the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. And of course, I will try and get to as many questions as we can towards the end of the talk. So to begin, I want to say that the migrant or migrants in the plural are the political figure of our time. Philosopher Thomas Neal proclaims in his 2015 monograph, um, and there's little we can say to the contrary, as in recent days, President Biden has, of course, signed an executive order on immigration that is to address, as he put it, the moral failings of the previous administration. The political discourse in the United States has, a long, has long centered on migration policies of exclusion, racism, quotas, and the last four years mark by a vibrant rhetoric of xenophobia backed by promises of walls, law and order, and the realities of families separated and young children incarcerated is of course an extreme, but also only the latest version and really only an exaggerated version of anti-migrant policies that have defined many US administrations. And it must be said that such policies are definitely nonpartisan in nature. In general, the mechanisms of mobility control, the machineries of border security and anti-immigrant politics that fueled them have created a world of walls, literal and figurative over the past century. In response, ever more creative, expansive and often exploitative clandestine networks have emerged promising to assist their clients in crossing borders and traversing front frontiers that every day become more militarized and uh, of course more dangerous. Here, of course, images of the European migrant crisis immediately come to mind as the world witnessed hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children crossing borders, fleeing poverty, and of course, war, images of crowded refugee camps and bodies washed up on Mediterranean shore is what we saw in our living rooms. As our guest today has noted in the first few pages of his book, I quote, the former lands of the Ottoman Empire from Libya to Iraq, Yemen to Macedonia, the Middle East has become the epicenter of the greatest migrant and refugee crisis in generations, unquote. But he also alerts us that, that as students of Armenian, Ottoman and Middle Eastern histories, we know of course that migration and expulsion from the region have a long history. We may almost immediately think back to the turn of the 20th century when war, famine, genocide, and eventually population exchanges drove communities from their ancestral homelands. It is this displacement, especially that of Armenians and Assyrians from the Ottoman Empire that contributed to the formulation of what today we might call an international refugee regime. So an important moment in international history. But movement and mobility for Armenians are not always the outcome of war, genocide, and disaster. Indeed, beginning in the mid-1880s, thousands of Arme Ottoman subjects, and this included Christian Maronites from Lebanon, as well as Armenians from the Eastern provinces, left their towns and villages for the Americas, North and South America. This story of mobility is a lesser, lesser known one and has been overshadowed by, of course, the violent expulsion and fierce journeys of survival that marked the first two decades of the 20th century. But to tell this lesser known story of the 19th century Armenian migration, um, is our guest uh, today. And for this, uh, Professor David Gutman is joining us from the East Coast. And we had scheduled this conversation nearly a year ago um, as David's book was coming out. Um, but as all campus events had to be canceled, we rescheduled with the hope of an in-person event this year. And, but here we are still 
zooming away. Dr. Gutman is Associate Professor at uh, Manhattanville College, where he currently is also serving as the chair of the history department. He's earned his PhD from Binghamton University, where he worked with the late Donald Cordard, a field, of course, a giant in the field of Ottoman history. And Dr. Gutman has published uh, widely in prestigious peer-reviewed journals, like the International Journal for Middle Eastern Studies, the Journal for Ottoman and Turkish Studies, Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, Interdisciplines, a journal of history and sociology. And today's talk is based on his new book, The Politics of Armenian Migration in the Late Ottoman Empire, Sojourners, Smugglers, and Dubious Citizens um, that, that came out with Edinburgh University Press in 2019. The book is out in hardcover, but as um, David informed me, it is also being uh, printed in paperback by the end of this month, and you can pre-order the, uh, the book already uh, through the University Press, and uh, we will be providing you a link that you have to click twice on. Um, and um, and a uh, code, a, um, uh, a coupon code, which will give you a really great deal on this on this fantastic book. So in his fascinating book, and uh, which I must say is written in beautiful prose, Dr. Gutman places the Armenian migrant into the larger history of global migration and explores an early phase in the tightening of systems of border and movement control. Here in Dr. Gutman not only explores the journey of the migrant with a particular eye on Armenians from Kharpout, but also the economy that took advantage of the desire to make a better life, an economy that would rely on the intricate network of smugglers and meddlers who defied the migration ban that had been put into place by the Hamidian regime. Dr. Gutman in his work asks, I quote, what drove uh, tens of thousands of Armenians to leave Harput for North America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries? Why did the regime of Sultan Abdul Hamid II see Armenian migration to North America as particularly threatening to the extent that it was willing to expend great, a great deal of time and resources on putting a stop to it? And who exactly were those dubious citizens who facilitated the movement, defying the system and smuggling men across the borders. And so I welcome uh, Dr. Gutman to this virtual screen and he will present us with some answers to this question. Welcome David to our virtual session here in Ann Arbor, Michigan and uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful and detailed introduction. Uh, thank you, Professor Tanelian, for uh, the generous uh, introduction. Thank you to Naira for uh, putting this all together uh, and allowing this to happen. Uh, I'm happy that we're able to manage this in uh, in some format, even if it's not in person. Uh, and of course, uh, while I would have loved to have been in Ann Arbor, uh, it's a place I've spent a lot of time in my life. Uh, I'm also happy that, that we're able to have this as a virtual event and, and be able to bring people uh, from all over the country and all over the world. Uh, so thank you very much for this and for this opportunity. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Hopefully this works without problem. Can everybody see on there? All right, perfect. So uh, I promise that uh, I keep my images to a minimum and, and, and no text. So I won't overwhelm with, with, with images or with text. Uh, but I wanted to uh, to start my discussion um, with a a little a little vignette, a little story uh, about the person that you see here uh, lying down, uh, Ohanis or Hovanis Topalian, who uh, was born in the year 1871 in uh, the town of Gurin or Gurun, uh, which is in uh, modern day central eastern Turkey. It's this little dot here. Um, he was born in Gurin in 1871, and uh, in 1891, at the tender age uh, of 20, he decided uh, to leave his hometown and his family uh, and go on a great journey. And uh, likely, 
moving through uh, smuggling channels uh, because uh, his movement, his desire to go to North America was uh, had been officially outlawed by the Ottoman state beginning in the late 1880s for reasons that I'll be talking about in a second. Uh, he likely transited through Alexandria and Egypt and eventually ended up in 1892 in the city of Providence, Rhode Island, where he worked for several years uh, in a factory alongside many of his countrymen, uh, as well as many others from throughout the world, Portuguese, Italians, Greeks, others who were working uh, alongside him in, uh, in the industrial town of Providence in the late 19th century. Uh, after five years of re residence in the United States in 1897, he uh, took advantage of the United States relatively liberal naturalization laws uh, at least for those who are not of Chinese background, and uh, naturalized as an American citizen. Uh, the subsequent year in 1898, perhaps overcome with a sense of patriotic fervor for his adoptive homeland, he um, enlisted in the United States Army uh, and shipped out to Cuba to fight in the Spanish-American War. And so the image that you see here, this is Ohanes who's, who's uh, laying down, it looks like he may be holding a dagger, you know, with his rifles and those of his comrades uh, shaped like a tent. Um, uh, it was taken likely in Cuba or perhaps before uh, shipping out uh, to combat. Uh, I love this picture for many reasons, not least because there's a certain sort of meta aspect to it, that it's a photograph of somebody taking a photograph uh, of, these, uh, of these three men. Uh, but he fights valiantly, uh, as far as we know, in the Spanish-American War, returning to Providence, uh, in 1899, where he works for a couple of more years before realizing in 1901, perhaps after having received uh, a letter from his family, um, beckoning him to return to his homeland. Uh, you know, at this point, he is at the ripe old age of 30. Uh, it's time to put uh, the life of the working bachelor behind him uh, and return to his home community to marry and to start a family. And so he does that in 1901. He makes the return trip to, uh, to the Ottoman Empire, once again, likely transiting through Alexandria on, uh, on a trip that would have likely taken several months, uh, arriving um, in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, likely after having acquired uh, a, an internal passport from the Khedive regime in Egypt uh, that would have helped him to bypass uh, Ottoman border authorities who would have debarred him from entering the empire if they had found out that he had been uh, in, uh, on an unlawful sojourn in the United States. Uh, he makes it past the border guards. He returns to his home community. He marries later that year, starts a family, has a young daughter by 1903-1904. Uh, and for several years, he remains in his home community um, uh, starting a family, making a living. But by 1906, he has decided it's time to once again return to his adoptive homeland, this time with his family in tow. So he uh, takes a trip from, uh, from, he's actually at this point not living in Gurin, he's living in the nearby city of Kaiseli. He uh, travels uh, about 100 kilometers north to the city of Sivas, the location of the closest American consul. Uh, he visits the consul and uh, presents his papers proving that he's an American citizen. He Brent presents the consul with, a, with his naturalization papers. He presents the consul with his uh, military discharge papers demonstrating that he was, um, that he had been uh, discharged, honorably discharged from the United States Army after having uh, faced combat in the Spanish-American War. He even performs drill for the consul to further prove that he is indeed who he says he is and is in fact uh, a, a loyal American citizen who, who did in fact serve in the United States Army. And he asks for a passport uh, as an American citizen that would allow, more easily allow with the protections of American citizenship, his family to leave the Ottoman Empire and travel to the United States. He is, um, despite all of the evidence that he's able to show, demonstrating that he is, as he argues, an American citizen in good standing, 
his uh, request is immediately rejected by the US consul who has been authorized by the State Department not to recognize uh, the citizenship status of any Armenian who returns to the Ottoman Empire uh, from the United States without making their, their um, citizenship status known upon entry to the Ottoman Empire. Because when Ohanis Topalian entered the, uh, re-entered the Ottoman Empire, he had hid the fact of his, um, uh, of his US citizenship. According to the US State Department, uh, he was no longer recognized as an American citizen, uh, at least while he was in the Ottoman Empire. So he leaves the consulate dejected, goes home without his passport, and he's forced once again uh, to essentially sneak out of the Ottoman Empire, um, landing, and he appears once again in 1907 in Alexandria, where he approaches the American consul there in Alexandria, Egypt, once again requesting uh, a passport, and he is once again uh, denied by the American consul in Alexandria. And so Ohanis' story uh, really nicely encapsulates uh, what this book is about. It really touches on the major themes uh, of the book. Uh, one of them being, uh, as, uh, as, as Melanie nicely pointed out, that, um, that the migration control regime, the global migration control regime that we know of today, that um, is dominated by travel documents such as passports and visas that separates people into categories of documented, undocumented, um, legal, illegal, um, that, um, and that uh, as a result of the punishing efforts that states engage in to prevent people from crossing borders results in all different forms of clandestine uh, migration uh, in order to bypass these um, strict and often draconian regulations on who can and cannot cross borders. Uh, that this system that we are very familiar with today, um, in fact, has its origins in the late 19th century, and that we can see through Ohanis's story, through the story of um, of the Armenian migrants that I'm going to be talking about today, we can see the birth. Uh, of this modern migration regime that today shapes how people move across borders. And that these Armenian migrants, that uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman state were central players in the making of this regime. And so that we need to bring not only um, historical studies of the emergence of the system into conversation uh, with sociologists, anthropologists, those working in cultural studies, uh, and other disciplines that study geography, that study uh, these questions today in the contemporary period. We need to bring history into dialogue uh, with that, but we also need, uh, I think, and, and hope to see moving forward, the Ottoman Empire, um, Armenian migrants, but Ottoman and Middle Eastern migrants more broadly also brought into the story of the making uh, of this migration control regime. Uh, and of these systems that we are so familiar with today because they were part and parcel uh, of its creation and they were there at its birth. In addition, uh, I see this book and in many ways Ohanis' story also as providing key insight into uh, the relationship between the Ottoman state and its Armenian populations in the decades before the Armenian genocide. Um, you know, we're starting to get very high quality studies uh, of the Armenian genocide and the dynamics that led to uh, the Ottoman state engaging in a process of genocidal destruction of Armenians during World War I. Uh, what we still to some extent lack are good studies that, that demonstrate uh, what was going on in the decades before that and how uh, the relationship between the Ottoman state uh, and, its, uh, and, and its Armenian populations evolved over the course of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So that's also a key uh, point that the book seeks to address. And really embodied by Ohanis' story uh, are five major questions that, uh, that the book uh, raises and seeks to answer. Uh, number one, uh, why, why does somebody like Ohanis Topalian uh, engage in migration? Why does, why does he end up in, uh, in North America? Uh, why does 
uh, the Ottoman state see Armenian migration, and I would say particularly Armenian migration, as dangerous? Uh, and why do they desire to prevent and control this mobility? Uh, how did people like Ohanis uh, Topalian leave uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, in the face of these prohibitions? Because that story is also um, also reveals the close link between uh, issues like mobility control and the emergence of clandestine migration. Uh, why would somebody like Ohanis Topalian desire to return to the Ottoman Empire? So we have this question of why are people leaving, but also the question of why uh, do people like Ohanis Topalian return to the Ottoman Empire in relatively large numbers? Uh, and finally, why does somebody like Ohanis Topalian become uh, at the center or, or find himself at the center of um, anti-migration discourse and politics, um, not only uh, from the perspective and position of the Ottoman state, but also the United States government. So that this is a story that takes place on three discrete levels. One, the local and regional level, two, the imperial level, and three, the global level, as I seek to uh, answer uh, these five central questions that are again embodied in the story of Ohanis Topaldian. And um, if I have some time toward the end, and if I forget to do this, you can raise this in the question and answer period. I'll, uh, I'll let you know what uh, Ohanis Topalian's um, fate was, because I leave you now with him uh, stuck in Alexandria. What becomes of Ohanis Topalian and his family after 1907? Uh, but I want to address quickly this first question. Uh, why are people migrating? Why do you have this large movement uh, of Armenian migrants in the decades before the Armenian genocide, in the decades before 1915, uh, to North America? And uh, you know, I think that the initial assumption would be that this is first and foremost uh, a flight from persecution, and this is something that my um, th that my book seeks to problematize or seeks to challenge a bit. That um, while there's of course no question that Armenians in, in particular in the mid 1890s are targets of widespread anti-Armenian violence, massacres and pogroms uh, throughout the Eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire. And this larger box you see here uh, is generally aligns with the, the region uh, where the majority uh, of, Arme of Ottoman Armenians live uh, before 1915. Uh, and so this is this, this area witnesses over the uh, mid 1890s, a, a wave of violence and pogroms directed at Armenian communities throughout uh, the Ottoman East. Um, but, and I, I should say that the numbers of Armenians who migrate in this period between 1885, roughly 1885 and 1915 is roughly 75 to 80,000. Um, but these 75 to 80,000 who make this journey are not coming uh, equally from all these regions uh, of the Ottoman East that are uh, indicated in this larger box. Rather, the majority, and certainly before the 1908 constitutional revolution, the vast majority of, uh, of Armenians who um, end up in North America are leaving from the small region you see here indicated uh, by this smaller box. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, centered on the dual cities of Harput or Harpert uh, and Mezre, which are here and include um, some other um, towns that, um, that certainly many of our guests here might be familiar with, uh, places like Palu, uh, Keri uh, or Kye uh, up here uh, on the, the northeast of this box, uh, as well as some of the smaller towns um, surrounding Harput Mezre, uh, like uh, Chemishkezeh, um, Charsanjak, uh, Parchenj, uh, and others. Uh, and so again, many of our guests, those of, who are descendants of these migrants will be familiar with many of these locations. But again, the majority, the vast majority, especially before 1908, of the 75,000 number are coming from this relatively small region. Um, those who are paying close attention will realize that Ohanis Topalian is an exception to this rule coming from Guri, which is outside of this box. But let's let's put him as the, the the kind of exception that proves the rule. You know, probably 75 to 80 percent of those that leave before 1908, in particular, leave from this small region here. Harput is the site of um, a pogrom uh, in 1895. 
uh, that sees um, the central parts of the central town sacked, including many of the buildings of the missionary school of Euphrates College burned. Uh, but it is not the uh, site of the worst violence and massacres that take place uh, either further east uh, in places like Sasun and Mush uh, or further to the south uh, and west. In fact, uh, an argument that I put forward in the book is that uh, migration, because what we're seeing here is that the majority of people who are leaving in this period are like Ohanis Topalion. They are not leaving with their families in tow. They are not, this is not a mass exodus uh, of, of entire communities, but rather it builds on older patterns of migration. So you have dating back to the early and mid 19th century, uh, large numbers of single men, um, Armenians, Kurds, Assyrians, who regularly migrate uh, throughout the Ottoman Empire to places like Istanbul, Adana, Aleppo, um, where um, even later to places like Baku, uh, Tiflis, uh, Batumi in, uh, in the Russian controlled parts of the Caucasus, uh, where they would work uh, for sometimes years at a time, remitting money back to their family in the Ottoman East. And this became part of uh, a strategy of economic survival for Armenian, Kurdish, um, Assyrian families throughout the Ottoman East. Uh, the migration to North America as it emerges in the late 1880s and 1890s builds upon these earlier patterns of migration. But a key thing that separates migration to North America from say migration to Istanbul, of course, is that for one, Providence, Rhode Island is a lot further away from Harput than Istanbul is. It's a lot more expensive to get there even as the advent of cheap steam shipping uh, in the 1880s to secondary ports like Mersin and Samsun uh, bring down the price of, um, of transatlantic steam tickets so that people like Johannes Topalian could afford them where they would not have been before the mid 1880s. Nevertheless, this is still uh, a very expensive prospect. It's a very risky prospect. And so I argue that uh, a major a uh, reason why the Harput region becomes the epicenter of this migration is because this migration, again, is part of an economic survival strategy, first and foremost. And um, it is an expensive and risky prospect. And so people are leaving the Harput region not because of a particularly acute privation, not because of, um, first and foremost, because of persecution, although certainly the the riot, the um, the program that takes place in Harput will help to increase uh, the numbers of families migrating. Nonetheless, still, even after the mid 1890s, there are still mostly single men leaving in search of work. The reason they're doing this is not because of economic privation, first and foremost, or because uh, of fear of persecution, but rather because of the relative, and I really want to emphasize that word relative, uh, economic stability uh, of Armenian communities in the Harput region compared to their contemporaries elsewhere in the Ottoman East. Uh, not to say that the, the Harput region by any means is uh, a paradise, that's not the argument, but rather that uh, there is a degree of economic security uh, and political uh, integration into the Ottoman system that allows Armenians to feel comfortable with making this very, very risky journey to the United States to then remit money um, and either return to their families or eventually to bring their families over to the United States. Uh, and that, that, um, that separates the Harput region in many ways uh, from many of the other regions uh, in the Ottoman East where her Armenian communities are, um, are much more exposed uh, to violence and economic privation. So uh, in many ways, this is a story of, of the relative uh, economic and political integration and success of the Armenian communities of the Harput region in comparison uh, of, to those elsewhere in the Ottoman East. There's another um, aspect of this story that, uh, that makes it um, even more expensive for Armenians to migrate to North America, even compared to uh, say, um, to Maronite uh, Christians uh, and others in the Levant who are migrating from places like Beirut. And that is the fact that the Ottoman state beginning in the late 1880s outlaws uh, explicitly Armenians from migrating to North America and also from returning uh, from sojourns, from illegal sojourns in, uh, in North America. 
The reason the Ottoman state targets Armenian migrants is because the Ottoman state views the emergence of large scale migration from the Harput region in the mid and late 1880s as being part and parcel of the process that also is witnessing the emergence of transnational Armenian political organizations. So you see uh, the creation of um, the Hinshakyan Revolutionary Party in 1887 um, that's followed in 1889 by uh, the creation or the founding uh, of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation or the Dashnak Sutsun. Um, so you see in the late, in the mid and late 1880s, the emergence of these Armenian political organizations, many of which have very firm transnational links. Um, the Hunchakian Revolutionary Party is founded in Geneva. The ARF, the Armenian Revolutionary Fa Federation is founded in Tbilisi of Tiflis uh, in the Russian empire. Uh, they have a wide ranging um, expansive connections with, um, with people really throughout the world, with Armenians in Europe, in Iran, in Russia and in the United States. And therefore the Ottoman state sees and views the emergence of large scale labor migration to North America from the Harput region as part and parcel, as, as related, as directly and inextricably related to the emergence of these political organizations. And uh, the Ottoman state is fearful, especially. One might think that, well, they're leaving. Uh, and if they're leaving, that means they can't cause trouble you know, in the Harput region. I mean, they should be encouraging people to leave. This is a common question that I get. Uh, but uh, the Ottoman state very, very quickly realizes that this migration isn't, isn't a unidirectional move, uh, that, that Armenians who are migrating to North America intend to return. And that is the primary source of concern that uh, Armenians will travel to North America, they will become radicalized in the you know, febrile political environment of the United States. Again, this is sort of the Ottoman headspace that's impelling this, uh, and then return to uh, the Ottoman Empire, perhaps with American citizenship, uh, and thus are, would be able to sow discord um, in this uh, strategically sensitive, from the perspective of the Ottoman state, uh, region of the empire. So this, uh, so this ban on Armenian migration is driven by the sense that Armenians in particular uh, pose a distinct and unique threat to the stability of, the Ottoman, of Ottoman control uh, of its Eastern provinces. And it's for that reason that Armenians are targeted for um, particular restrictions that, for example, Muslims and Assyrians who are also migrating from these regions in, in lesser amounts do not face. And that's why um, I, I emphasize, especially the uniqueness of the Armenian case, that, um, that the Armenian, specifically the experience of migrating from this region to North America and also returning is, is shaped in a distinct way uh, by the Armenian-ness, uh, or at least as the Ottoman state understands it, the Armenian-ness of these migrants. And so that's an important reason why I focus special attention on the, on, uh, in the book on the uniqueness uh, of, of the Armenian case, um, because Armenians were conjured as a specific threat. So this raises another important question. If you can't leave legally, Armenians cannot, for the most part, leave after 1888 the Ottoman state legally to go to the United States. So how do people leave in the face of these restrictions? Well, as we're very familiar with today, restrictions on migration do not or does not mean, a restriction on migration does not mean that people will abide by those restrictions. Uh, certainly we understand that from the present day, that people find ways to bypass restrictions on mobility, right? This is, this is where the concept of legal versus illegal immigration comes from. Uh, similarly, in the beginning in the late 1880s, when this ban on migration is put in place, uh, Armenians start migrating through clandestine channels. And very quickly, beginning in the late 1880s, uh, sophisticated smuggling channels. What this, what this map is, uh, is a kind of an ad hoc map of these smuggling channels that emerge beginning in the 1880s. Uh, the first one sees uh, Armenians leaving from the Harput region to go to Samsun and then to Istanbul. Um, later, beginning in the early 1890s, increasingly Armenians go to the coastal city of Mersin, uh, where they leave from there. 
Um, and then as the Ottoman state tries to crack down on, on migration beginning in the uh, first decade of the 20th century through these more tried and true routes from Harput to Samsun, and Harput to Marisin, um, Armenians are going as far afield as Latakia and Beirut and Cyprus. Um, as you can see, and so travel between Harput and these various areas, whether it's, it's Trabzon, Samsun, um, uh, uh, Bitli, uh, not Bitli, um, Batumi, uh, Marisin, Beirut. There are no tra uh, train links linking these places together. This travel is conducted entirely on foot or almost entirely on foot. When, um, when Armenian migrants reach coastal cities, whether it's Samsun, Mersin, uh, Beirut, they, um, they are met by a dense network of intermediaries who house them, who arrange travel for them, who then uh, boatmen who then sneak them onto waiting ships, uh, waiting European steamers, uh, often anchored just off of the coast um, to uh, under the cover of night to avoid detection by Ottoman authorities. So what I'm saying here is that these are these aren't just travel routes. These smuggling routes are very highly coordinated uh, across space, meaning that you know a um, an agent in Harput who uh, a migrant might contract with uh, to smuggle them out of the empire is then connected to networks in places like Mersin and Beirut that then are responsible for uh, arranging travel for migrants once they arrive in these coastal cities. Then once migrants leave, they face an entirely new network of intermediaries in places like Providence or Boston in New York, uh, who are then responsible uh, for uh, getting migrants to pay up on their smuggling debts. Because smuggling is a very, this process um, adds a lot of cost to the cost of travel. Um, so it's much more costly uh, for Armenian migrants. And also, I should say also Muslims and, and Assyrians who often migrate through these same channels, even though they don't face the same uh, restrictions on their mobility, um, it greatly increases the cost of travel compared to, for example, uh, those who are leaving uh, places like Beirut, um, you know, um, Maronites who are leaving places like Beirut um, and uh, who don't face the same kind of restrictions. Uh, and so these are highly coordinated, but also highly expensive networks. Much oftentimes travel through them as finance through debt, which then migrants have to pay once they uh, arrive in the United States. And again, they're often faced by debt collectors who are connected to these agents based in the Harput region, uh, who then facilitate transfers of payments um, to their, uh, to their aid, migration agents back at home, uh, probably by leveraging uh, the sending of remittances and letters. Um, you know, we're not going to send those remittances for you. We're not going to arrange for your letters to get back to your family unless you're paying your debts. So this is to say these are highly coordinated networks that uh, essentially operate on principles very similar to what we see in the contemporary period. So the dynamics that drive the evolution of migrant smuggling in the late 19th and early 20th centuries are very, very closely parallel uh, those same dynamics that we see today, for example, uh, in the 21st century Mediterranean. So, uh, oh, I didn't need to lose my slide, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, another major question is the question of return migration. Uh, Ohanes uh, not only migrates to North America, but he also uh, returns from his sojourn in North America. And I estimate uh, using a, a mix of, uh, of Ottoman sources and American sources that a conservative estimate of about 20 to 25 percent of Armenians who migrate to North America eventually return. Um, return here, and I want to make I want to be very specific that return uh, can be temporary and return can be permanent. So this can be people like Ohanes who return for a few years with the intention of going back to the United States. Those who return maybe for a summer, and I have uh, I have a couple of examples of people who make multiple journeys across the Atlantic, and those who also return permanently um, and don't travel back uh, to the United States or Canada after returning home. Uh, return is also a central part of this story uh, because uh, it reveals the um, the uh, the kind of global implications of our Ar Armenian mobility in this period. 
Um, return is also outlawed by the Ottoman state. If an Armenian returns to, uh, and is, it is revealed to have returned from an un unlawful sojourn in North America, they could face immediate debarment from the empire. And so many Armenians like Johannes Topalian are forced to, excuse me, enter through the back door. So many end up in Alexandria where they, uh, where they get, um, uh, where they get uh, travel documents that allow them to conceal the fact that they had been in the United States, or uh, especially in the first decade of the 20th century, they contract with many of the same uh, my, uh, intermediaries and smugglers that had helped them get out uh, of the empire, help them to re-enter the empire um, outside of the view of Ottoman authorities. So return also is, um, is often done clandestinely, um, people have to hide the fact, uh, with few exceptions, hide the fact that they had been in North America. And this creates a whole series of problems uh, because many Armenians, while they were in the United States, naturalized as American citizens. And for those of you who have some familiarity with Ottoman history, this is the uh, period of the capitulations. Um, these are a series of extraterritorial treaties that the Ottoman Empire had signed with various powers uh, over the course of the uh, 17th, 18th, and into the 19th centuries that by the 19th century gave extraordinary protections, um, extra legal protections to the citizens and nationals of states that had capitulary, uh, signed capitulatory treaties with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the United States signed one of these treaties, I believe in 1829, 1830. So uh, American nationals, American citizens are beneficiaries of these treaties that uh, give uh, a wide range of extraterritorial protections to, um, to American nationals, including those who naturalize. And this is a big concern for the Ottoman state. One of the main issues that impel the um, uh, outlawing out migration and then also, uh, also outlawing return migration is a real fear that Armenians could return to their home communities with American citizenship after having naturalized as American citizens and benefit from those extraterritorial protections. Uh, and so therefore the Ottoman state wouldn't be able to detain them, for example, on suspicion of engaging in revolutionary politics or something like this. This is what is driving uh, uh, Ottoman concern about both out migration and return migration. So um, beginning in the mid 1890s, as you see larger numbers of Armenians return in the midst of these pogroms and massacres that are taking place in the uh, Ottoman East, anti-Armenian pogroms and massacres that are taking place in the Ottoman East in the mid 1890s, the uh, uh, Armenians start returning to uh, places like Samsun bearing American passports. And uh, they are immediately, some are, are debarred from entering uh, the, uh, the empire and essentially put back on ships uh, out of the empire. Others are arrested and detained for long periods of time. This is happening again against the backdrop of these massacres, which is a big media phenomenon in the United States. So the massacres of Armenians that are taking place in the mid 1890s are uh, splashed across the front pages of major American newspapers. There's a big public outcry in the United States as a result of these massacres um, as, you know, as, um, mission, as American missionary reports are uh, getting back to American press organs. So this is one of these early examples of, uh, of real American interest in uh, the suffering of people uh, in far flung corners of the earth. Uh, and so there's a real interest, a public interest in the United States about the fate of uh, Ottoman Armenians in the mid 1890s. And against this backdrop, there's these reports of Armenian, uh, of Armenian Americans who are displaying American passports when they return to the empire and being arrested, detained, mistreated. So this also becomes a major media firestorm in the United States. And the Ottoman Empire becomes a target of particular ire, both as a result of the massacres, but also uh, what is seen as the uh, mistreatment of American citizens. And so this becomes a real public relations disaster for the Ottoman Empire at the worst time. 
Uh, but of course, the mid 1890s are also at the same time, we're also witnessing the rise of modern, what we might call modern anti-immigration discourse and restrictionist politics in the United States. Uh, of course, we have the passage of the uh, Chinese Restriction Act in 1881 uh, that is strengthened in the late 1880s. Uh, you have a raft of uh, proposed legislation in the 1890s seeking to um, strengthen uh, restrictions on people, on the poor, on those seen as politically undesirable from coming to the United States. So there's also this growing tide of anti-immigrant sentiment in the United States in the 1890s. And in the United States at this time is a particularly savvy America, uh, our Ottoman ambassador named uh, Mavroyeni Bey. He is uh, Alexandros Mavroyeni. He is the scion of a wealthy and connected uh, Greek Orthodox Christian family in Istanbul. His father, I believe, was one of the sur uh, surgeons for Sultan Abdul Majid. Uh, so very, very close ties to not only the Ottoman state, but to the crown itself. Um, Alexandros Mavroyeni had been uh, named as ambassador to the United States in 1893. He is there trying to, he is a kind of public relations guru. So in the midst of this uh, firestorm of controversy that the Ottoman Empire finds itself in, in the mid 1890s, he is looking to craft a narrative that, um, that against the kind of sympathetic light that Ottoman Armenians find themselves in the American press. And uh, one thing that he latches onto is this story of naturalized citizens, American citizens, Armenian Americans who are returning to the Ottoman Empire. So he begins over the course of the 1895, 1896, placing these editorials in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Herald, other uh, major US press outlets that portray these returning Armenians in very negative light, uh, arguing that these Armenians are returning to the Ottoman Empire to cause all sorts of dissent, uh, to stir trouble, to misuse their American citizenship, to abuse their American citizenship, that they're using their American citizenship status as a flag of convenience to, um, to gain extraterritorial protection so they can cause problems. Um, in the Ottoman East. Mavroyani Bey is finding a American public, especially as the massacres begin to subside and fade out of view. Remember, Americans have very, very short uh, memories, right? Once something fades from the press, it disappears for all time. By the late 1890s, uh, this storyline of Armenians returning to the Ottoman Empire to abuse their citizenship status, that finds a very, very, um, uh, a, a very, very welcoming audience in the United States and especially within uh, you know, foreign policy and State Department circles of the US government that are becoming more hostile to immigration. And you know, Alexander Smavrieni is very, very keen to compare Ottoman concerns about Armenian return migration with American concerns uh, about unregulated immigration into the United States, right? You're worried about anarchists coming to the United States we're worried about Armenian anarchists returning to the Ottoman Empire. We share the same concerns. And there is a very receptive audience to that argument by the late 1890s. And so uh, it's in this context that in 1901, the US State Department issues a directive. Uh, this is not a piece of legislation. This is effectively um, uh, State Department fiat that effectively strips uh, naturalize Armenian American citizens of their citizenship status if they return to the Ottoman Empire while concealing the fact of their American citizenship when they arrive back to the Ottoman Empire. The rub here is they have that if you are returning to the Ottoman Empire, you have no choice but to conceal your American citizenship status. If you reveal your American citizenship status at port, that's going to demonstrate that you were abroad illegally and therefore by Ottoman law, you can be debarred from entering. So if you want to go back home to visit your family, to get married, to open up a little shop, whatever it might be, you have no choice but to conceal your citizenship status. And so this becomes a major issue um, after the issuing of this directive. Uh, the United States and the Ottoman Empire 
1901 are essentially on the same page about Armenian migration and return migration. So it goes within a period of a few years from American policy being very sympathetic to the plight uh, of Armenians and Armenian returnees to essentially view it seeing eye to eye with the Ottoman state uh, and essentially being exactly on the same page about their policies vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, Armenian returnees. And uh, effectively the United States um, legation in the Ottoman Empire gives the green light by uh, 1905 for the, Ottomans, for the Ottoman state to begin a, a process of deporting those who are discovered, who are back in the Ottoman Empire, who are discovered to have returned unlawfully, uh, deporting them, uh, even those who had returned several years before from unlawful sojourns to North America, uh, expelling them from the Ottoman Empire. And I actually call it a, a form of deportation. Um, An order is brought against these individuals. They are then uh, transported under armed guard to Trabzon or Samsun, put on a ship and forced to leave the Ottoman Empire. Um, that policy that emerges in the first half uh, of the first decade of the 20th century is not possible without the expressed support uh, of the United States that is fully convinced by the Ottoman argument that, uh, that Armenian migrants and returnees face the threat that the Ottoman state or that they pose the threat that the Ottoman state claims that they pose. Um, and so we see here again, the emergence of, um, you know, of these ideas of the migrant as threat, uh, of the use of strategies like deportation um, as, uh, as a strategy to deal with the perceived threat of migration uh, and migrants themselves. But we see the emergence of, uh, of, of complex smuggling networks as a major part of the story. This is why I'm saying that the Armenian, why the central argument of the book is that the, that the Armenian case and the Ottoman case demonstrates how closely they are involved in the birth of this modern uh, migration system of migration and mobility control. Now, I'll end very quickly with saying that the book ends, um, the last section of the book ends with the aftermath of the 1908 Young Turk Revolution, in which many of the, um, in fact, all of the prohibitions on Armenian migration and return, and in fact, of any prohibitions on anybody's uh, right to migrate uh, are lifted. This creates an entirely new uh, mobility control regime in the Ottoman Empire. Now Armenians, as well as anybody else, can leave, uh, at least initially, can leave and return at will. Uh, and so after 1908, you see much larger numbers of people uh, leaving from other parts of the Ottoman East where it was not so easy to do so before. Uh, you see also a big spike in return migration in the aftermath of the 1908 revolution. Um, and up until 1914, large numbers of Armenians are both leaving and returning. In fact, the largest number of Armenians, at least by American statistics, returned to the Ottoman Empire in 1914, uh, a year before the Armenian genocide. Uh, of course, that all changes when World War I uh, when the Ottoman Empire uh, joins World War I. Uh, then in 1915, of course, you have the Armenian genocide, the mass deportation and murder of hundreds of thousands of Armenians uh, from the Ottoman East. The Harput region is absolutely decimated during the Armenian genocide. Uh, and famously, uh, the American consul in Harput at the time, Leslie Davis, who wrote a famous book that's uh, available, widely published and available, uh, in many libraries called uh, Slaughterhouse Province that talks about what he witnessed as the American consul in Harputz in 1915 during the Armenian genocide. He talks about uh, people coming up to him claiming American citizenship, uh, either as the dependents of American citizens who are living in the United States or as uh, uh, returnees who had uh, secured American citizenship while abroad. And he talks about how um, even in the midst of the genocide, his hands were tied by State Department policy uh, to be able to help these people, even though they could claim American citizenship. Uh, so this, this, of course, also has profound implications uh, for the Ar Armenian genocide and also in the aftermath, uh, major questions about the fate of Armenian properties uh, in the aftermath of the genocide with this added question uh, of those who could claim American citizenship. And that becomes a key aspect of debate between the United States government and the Turkish Republic in the aftermath of the Armenian genocide. So uh, I'm gonna end it there because I hope that we have some time for question and answer. 
but hopefully that gives a good overview uh, of what the book is about. Thank you. Thank you so very much, David, for this wonderful talk. And it is a fascinating story of migration. And I definitely very much appreciated you starting with a human story, um, of course, of Ohanes Topalian. And you did not tell us what happened to him. So I will be the, the person that will ask what happened to Ohanes uh, in after he entered back. No, I knew I was going to do that. I always I get, I get in the zone and then I forget to <laughs> circle back to Ohana. So thank you very much. Um, so Ohana Stopalian eventually is successful in getting back to the United States. So he reappears in American uh, records by 1908. Uh, he's able to reunite with his, um, with his wife and his daughter. Uh, so they escape. Um, the Armenian Genocide, they're safely in the United States by 1908 or 1909. Um, he has by then a second daughter um, who uh, lives up until the early 2000s. And so he, uh, she in fact uh, left her uh, father's papers. Uh, both of his children unfortunately died without, um, without children. So uh, he didn't go beyond his daughter's line, uh, but she left her family papers with Project Save. Um, which is the um, kind of this large uh, repository of Armenian images and documents. So um, actually, after I published the book, I found that they have, Project Save has Ohanes Topalian, not only that image, uh, but also has Ohanes Topalian um, uh, military discharge papers and his naturalization papers. So I've actually seen the papers that he presents to the US consul uh, when he visits him in Sivas uh, in 1907. Uh, but happily for o Ohanes and his family, they do they do survive. They are able to uh, make it to the United States despite the challenges. And you have met some Topalians. I, I you briefly spoke about it before we went online, but you sort of shared a little story with me that I thought was quite amazing. Right, I, I gave a similar book talk uh, to the Armenian Institute, which is based in London. And uh, one of the uh, participants um, came on and said, my family are Topalians from Gurin, and I'm pretty sure that Ohana's Topalian is in my family tree. Um, and so, you know, that's the nature of doing work on migration. There's always these sorts of small, uh, small world stories that, that come along. So yeah. um, in, in London, so are still, <laughs> London, right, exactly. Yeah. So there are still Gurinsi Topalians uh, out there um, in so, so I'm going to go to the audience question, questions. We have lots of them, um, which is great. And um, I'll take you through some, some of them and hopefully we get to most of them. Um, you ended with sort of 1915, but uh, of course, uh, leading up to it, uh, you talked about 19, 1908 as an important moment that shifted the regime itself. Armin Parnosian is asking to what extent, if at all, did the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 represent a pull factor for Armenians who had immigrated to return? So he's not asking about the aftermath, but rather what is it about that particular moment, perhaps of the revolution itself, the moment leading up to the revolution, and did that have an impact on Ar Armenians migrating back to the Ottoman Empire? Oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, I have to unmute myself. Sorry. Oh, about just that. Keep yeah, yeah. Unmuted. <laughs> I'll keep myself unmuted. Apologies yeah. for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the revolution, and, and we can see this in the data. Uh, the number of Armenians who return in the aftermath of the Young Turk Revolution grow, goes up dramatically um, between 1908 and 1914. I mean, as best as 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 we, you know, the data isn't fantastic that we have, uh, but that seems pretty clear. Um, and the idea of being able to return without facing these kinds of consequences uh, that Armenian returnees faced before 1908 certainly was a huge pull uh, back, at least for temporary visits, if not for permanent returns. Mm -hmm. um, and and this is also, I mean, this is a, this is an important part of the story too that um, Armenian political organizations are, are especially concerned about this question of migration. You know, what does it mean to have so many people, especially young men? leaving their home communities, um, becoming Americanized, 
um, you know, maybe turning their backs on their homeland. Um, and and that's that's reflected in some of the uh, of the Armenian press. Uh, so there is efforts to also encourage Armenians to migrate, especially back to return home in, in the aftermath of, of 1908. Um, Robert Myrak, who famously wrote a book now that is almost as old as I am, published in 1983, um, he talks about this also a little bit, um, and he and he suggests that um, that you know that uh, these Armenian political organizations weren't successful or largely weren't successful in encouraging people to return. Um, I think it's a little bit more mixed than that because you do see um, and and you do also see this uh, revealed in some of the. Uh, memoirs and village histories that exist out there, uh, mm -hmm. talking about how many people are coming back, especially in the aftermath of 1908, hoping to benefit from uh, that much more liberalized and safer, you know, ironically, uh, atmosphere. Yeah, so it's it's really fascinating how, of course, sort of these global or these sort of um, major events, historical events shaped and shifted this migration, um, which leads me to the sec our second question, which hints at another historical event that you didn't talk about, which is the Balkan Wars, which obviously um, is, is, a, is, is a point uh, where migration, of course, also from the Balkans into the Eastern provinces is, uh, is something to be thought of. Uh, thought of. And mm -hmm. uh, Berkan Chanklar asks, how should we think of the Balkan Wars and the changing demographics of Eastern cities in the Ottoman Empire? Would it not be aspiring for Ottoman Empire to informally facilitate those migration routes? So, so what's interesting with the Balkan Wars, and the Balkan Wars do sort of reflect, um, I would say, both the Balkan Wars and, and to a lesser extent, the war in, um, in Libya, the Italian uh, attack on mm -hmm. Libya. Um, they actually are, at least for, for my migration story, and I see that, that Davy Mayers is also on this, uh, on, yeah. on here. So she'll also, this is be familiar with her work also, uh, that this is, that's kind of a transformative moment in this experimentation, post-1908 experimentation uh, with liberalized uh, mobility control. Uh, because um, a problem that you see, and what's really interesting in the documentation, in the Ottoman documentation, is that after 1908, specific concern about Armenian migration largely disappears from, uh, from the historical record, um, mm -hmm. at least in what's available to me. Um, instead, the concerns, the migration concerns become very different. Uh, instead of worrying specifically about Armenians, it's worrying about people, about this all of a sudden large exodus of people after 1908, not just Armenians, but uh, Ottoman Jews, Members of, um, you know, people leaving from the hinterlands of, of places like Salonika um, right before the war. Um, so the concerns are very different. It's, we can't have these people leaving. Who's going to build a new constitutional order if so many people are leaving? And what does that say about this new liberal environment if people are leaving? That doesn't reflect good on, well on us. And then the war comes in and there's a whole new set of concerns, which is uh, we've got to have people in the army. <laughs> we can't have people leaving um, uh, and, and not fighting these wars. And we've got to have a population to be able to survive. Uh, and then you see the introduction of new restrictions on, on migration. Um, but the concern specifically about the Ottoman East is, is shifted in the aftermath uh, of, of 1908. And there's a general, much broader concern about people leaving in general, uh, how to encourage people to return, um, those sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of um, networks and migration networks, you talked, you talked of course, um, about the United States in your talk. Um, one of our audience members has a question, Timur Saitov, who's asking, who's saying, of course, thank you for this wonderful presentation, David. Um, did Armenian migration networks exist in other non-American direction, Europe, Russia, and what was the administration of the Ottoman Empire? Was it equally concerned about those directions? Right, yeah, excellent question. So yes, of course, there's also at the same time large migrations of Armenians to the Caucasus, um, lesser extent of places like Iran, Egypt, um, and increasingly, especially uh, after the turn of the 20th century, so after 1900, the Ottomans become much more concerned also about Armenian migration to Russia. Um, Armenian migration to Russia is geographically different. Those who are going to places like 
uh, business and um, Tbilisi are primarily coming from uh, northeastern Anatolia, so places like Van, uh, Bitlis, uh, Erzurum. So the geography of migration to Russia is a bit different. Um, not surprisingly, people who live closer to the Russian frontier are much more likely to make that trip. Uh, the Ottomans, though, do work to crack down on that. And actually, uh, especially after 1905, um, after the 1905 Russian Revolution, they're really concerned about cross-border movements because they don't want ha what happened in 1905 then to happen um, in the Ottoman Empire, which of course it does eventually in 1908. Uh, but there's a real um, acute concern about that, especially after 1905. That's very vividly reflected in documentary material. Um, you know, with what's happening in Russia, we can't have these Armenians now going back and forth between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. So they try to um, they try to um, level the same kinds of restrictions on Ottoman migra on Armenian migration to Russia, but that's mm -hmm. a, a lot harder to police uh, mm -hmm. because, of course, there's a land border. It's right there. Uh, there are already these networks in place helping people across the border. So it's a it's a much harder and much more difficult. Um, a thing for the Ottoman state to achieve, but they do try it and they are certainly aware and concerned about that movement. Which brings me to a question of your your sort of historical methods that um, that uh, sort of perhaps connects to Josep Torosian's question. Um, who says this is an excellent uh, presentation and is wondering whether or not you can estimate the numbers of Armenians immigrating in this case, of course, from Harput, but is it possible? What, how are you tracing your, your Armenian subjects? Are, are you, is it, is it possible to quantify this? And then I'll shift to uh, two sort of more thematic uh, questions around gender and race. But I think sort of thinking mm -hmm. about the met methodology, I think would be in, uh, interesting whether right. or not it is quantifiable and how are you how are you maneuvering through your sources? So, so uh, I mean, it's basically quantifiable in the sense that the United States um, beginning in 1899, uh, before 1899, uh, excuse me, uh, American um, uh, migration statistics are, for the Ottoman Empire are, are based on Turkey in Europe, Turkey in Asia. So you can't disaggregate, okay, who is in those groups. After 1899, they become a lot more detailed. So Armenians, um, Syrians, uh, Greeks, Turks, that kind of thing. So it becomes much more detailed. And there from a basic level, you can quantify, uh, in terms of quantifying from regions. So, I mean, exactly how many people are leaving from Harput, it's harder to do. Uh, obviously, the U.S. isn't collecting that kind of data. The Ottomans aren't collecting specific data on out migration, uh, but they consistently say before 1908 that um, that migration is a Harput region thing. Mm. It is from the Harput and its surrounding regions, from Mamaretul Aziz. You can. There are shipping records, so you can look at the shipping records that are available either online. There is somebody, there is actually a scholar, um, actually like an Armenian community historian, I can't remember her name, uh, but in the 1980s or 1990s, she actually published a book um, that has, that is just the shipping records, looking for every Armenian name. Um, and that's published, I think that you can get that, I think Nasser may still have copies of that book. Um, and um, there you can see it lists where specifically city these people are coming from. And you can see it reflected that 65, 75% uh, are coming from, um, from Harpert or thereabouts. Um, so in that region. Um, and that's probably the best kind of data for out migration. For return migration, that's where the Ottoman sources are especially useful. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ottomans were, before 1908, very interested. There were periods I didn't talk about, um, but there was a period in the late 1890s and up until 1901 when the Ottoman state did allow Armenians who arrived in Samsun to go back to their home communities, even though they knew they were coming back from the United States, if they signed essentially an agreement that they wouldn't do anything illegal. Um, and during that period, during that window of time, uh, the Ottomans were keeping regularly monthly numbers on how many people were returning through the port of Samsun. And that gives us a window into the volume of return. And so, um, you know, in, in 1899, 1900, regularly 40, 50 people are returning each month. 
uh, thereabouts. That's just through SAMHSA. That doesn't capture everybody who's returning through other ports of entry. Um, and it's from there that I'm able to glean some degree of the volume uh, of return migration. And then some of it also was just counting um, mm -hmm. people that they talk about in the Ottoman documents. Um, so I'm able to, um, to, and I talk about this in the book, yeah. um, you know, several hundred individual cases of return uh, reflected in the Ottoman documents. And of course that doesn't count those who aren't being captured in the Ottoman documentary material. So yeah. it's it's a laborious process, but but that information is is there. Is there a spreadsheet that is going to develop into a digital migration map? Oh no, I, I guess I could do that. I think that I have somewhere, you know, where I'm taking the individual notes of okay, who's coming. So that's yeah. actually not a bad idea. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, big project. Seeds. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> Planting seeds of projects. So coming to Debbie Mays um who is in the audience and a good friend of ours david uh she says it's great to see you and hear more about your project my question relates to women in this process did many women leave on their own or with their family members and if so in what ways uh, might their experience have been unique did our american restriction on return migration increase the number of women migrating in order to marry someone who had already left right so so this is a great question um, and um, it's um, an important one because, uh, <clears throat> for example, the gender dynamics of Armenian migration are different than the gender dynamics of uh, migration from the Levant, let's say, or, or, or the migration that you talk about in your wonderful book, David, that I just had the chance to read a couple of weeks ago and very much enjoyed. Um, and that is that um, it really builds upon this older pattern of migration within the Ottoman Empire. Um, and there's an Armenian word for it, Pandukh, these uh, temporary migrants who, you know, seasonal or, or temporary migrants, you know, who go to Istanbul and work for a few years and then come back. Um, that, that migration, that older migration is very gendered male uh, in contrast to, for example, uh, you know, uh, what uh, Akram Kata talks about with, with, with women workers who, are, who, you know, with the decline of the silk industry, in Mount Lebanon, who then turned to uh, long distance migration in numbers close to that of men. Uh, that's not the case in the, uh, an Armenian case where it's much more um, built on these older uh, sort of coded male um, uh, migratory patterns. That being said, uh, the, a really interesting gender dynamic is introduced when, um, when especially Armenian men who have already left seek to reunite with their families. Um, and in the late 1890s, the Ottoman state introduces a, its only form of legal migration for Armenians. Um, and this in fact creates two different streams of migration. One, illegal migration. In fact, they use different words in Ottoman, firar etmek, to mean those who are leaving e illegally, hijret etmek, for those who are leaving legally. Um, in order to leave legally, you had to agree to cut off, to um, forswear your Ottoman nationality, agree never to return and cut off all sort of economic connections with your home communities. And the logic here is, should be obvious. Um, we are fine with Armenians leaving as long as they leave permanently. And we are going to ensure that they're leaving permanently. And that is the logic that's impelling this. And this, um, this channel of legal migration um, becomes increasingly used for essentially for family reunification. Mm. Uh, so you see a lot of um, women and dependent children who, um, who, who then migrate through this channel, uh, often beginning in 1901 with the opening of the American consulate with the help uh, of the American consulate. Uh, they're willing to help uh, naturalize Armenians who are staying in the United States. It's a different question if they return. Um, and that becomes the way by which many women, um, dependent children, but also you know, many men also travel through this legal route, but that comes with the, increased challenge if you leave through that legal route, it makes it that much harder to return if you want to return uh, because the Ottoman state is especially watching out for those who leave through these legal channels. And um, a, a, a colleague of mine in the anthropology department at uh, Rutgers, um, whose name Zainab, whose last name is just- Gursal. Uh, escaping me at the minute. Gursal, thank you, Zainab Gursal. Sorry, my mind gets it's tired. It's one of our uh, audience. Zainab will be, uh, I, hang on, before you continue, 
Um, Harry Mazadurian is actually asking a question about your collaboration with Zainab Bursal okay. at Rutgers. Oh, okay, okay, and, okay. thank you. Uh, and, and he's asking whether or not you have collaborated with her concerning your findings and the list of photographs and list of name and what parallels you. you yeah, so we, we've been, we've been so in very close contact. So, so that's, that's, that's why I wanted to, to, to add that there. That she's working on that, that legal channel that involved um, was very bureaucratically involved. It, it, it involved the taking of photographs. So those who were authorized to leave through that channel had their photographs taken. They had to actually supply a photograph to Ottoman authorities. One was sent to Istanbul, one was uh, sent to the port of embarkation. The idea being, we're gonna keep these photos on file and if these people try to return, that's going to be our evidence that they have, that they have migrated through this legal channel and are under no circumstances is allowed to return to the empire. Um, so, so she's doing that work and kind of picking up on um, one of those aspects that's discussed in the book, but isn't really uh, discussed in great detail. And I wanna emphasize that I don't, my, my book is by no means definitive. It's, it's, it's a start and a mm. very, very basic start. I think if there are any graduate students or others in the, in the audience uh, who are looking for projects and there's so much richness here um, and this book is but a start um, and so there are many questions that are that are left out there, uh, and she's trying to answer some of those with a with a truly fascinating project, looking at the kind of after stories of these pictures that were taken. Um, and I think that that, that Davy, you you also encountered some of this in your own work, similar kinds of uh, of questions also um, in your own work that especially uh, you know that carry over even into the post 1908 period. Wonderful. So I'm shift, going to shift from uh, from gender to to race and mm -hmm. thinking a little bit about the United States context. Um, uh, Anush Suni is asking um, you uh, if you would uh, talk a bit more about how immigration of Armenians and other ethnic groups to the U United States in the period that you discussed figured into legal constructions of race and whiteness in the United States. Mm -hmm. so that's a huge question. Um, right. Um, and, and let me throw you another one right there okay. from one of our graduate students, Manoj uh, Shakarian. Um, who is uh, um, asking about the assimilation, assimilation and living experience of Armenian migrants in the United States. So it's, it's sort of related, I think. Did they live in areas urban or rural uh, where, other, uh, where other migrants from the Middle East settled or did they develop, develop intercommunal relations with other immigrants from the Ottoman Empire, such as those from the Levant? And I think the sort of assimilation integration story relates as well to the story of uh, of race and and also um, uh, creating a, a perception of Armenians as uh, as uh, as white in the American right. context. So to to Anusha's question, um, so I don't talk. So there are two, of course, big defining court cases: one in 1909 and one in 1925. And of course, the names are escaping me because my mind is is <laughs> is, is is starting to sunset a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. But those those that officially define an American law that kind of set uh, that that allow Armenians to claim whiteness, which of course was uh, an open question in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, and not so not only Armenians but of course other um, other other populations that were coded as Middle Eastern or Near Eastern. You know, where do they are they Asian? Are they you know do we treat them as we do Chinese and other Asian immigrants, or do we treat them? Um, you know, do we code them as white? And eventually, of course, as a result of those decisions, uh, Armenians are coded as as white, uh, at least avoiding, uh, you know, being codified as Asian or or yellow, or that would have uh, made them would have put them under the umbrella of Chinese and later Asian exclusion. Uh, I don't talk about that. Uh, directly in the book. It's a little bit outside of the frame of the book, but I would say that my book addresses the prehistory of those cases uh, because uh, we see, I mean, that kind of racial regime is only just beginning to emerge in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It really begins to crystallize beginning in the second decade of the 20th century, and especially with the introduction of uh, the immigration quotas in 1924. In 1925, where you really see that really gel and take its, I guess, final shape. Um, but I think what, what I'm talking about in the book is really the prehistory of that. 
in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, where you see as a result of this kind of ad hoc agreement between the United States and the Ottoman government. And there's this fascinating discussion uh, between uh, the between Ma Mavroyeni Bay, this is in the, this is 1895, 1896, and uh, the Secretary of State uh, under Grover Cleveland, um, in which um, you know essentially the U.S. government is complaining that um, that the Ottomans are targeting Armenians who are returning based on their it's a blue ras their race based off of their nationality of who they are, and and effectively Mavroyeni. Uh, implies that, well, you guys are doing the same thing with the Chinese. I mean, you guys are barring the Chinese from entering the United States because of their Chineseness. How is what we're doing anything different than what you're doing? Um, and what's fascinating about this is at one time, Mabrayani Bay is very, very interested and concerned about Ottoman public image and about also the image that Ottoman um, subjects, Ottoman nationals in the United States that they present. Um, uh, in front of their American audiences. So he's really worried about that. You know, I hope they're you know, acting in a civilized way that puts a good name on the, on mm -hmm. the Ottoman state. But at the same time, he's more than happy to recognize that, well, in the late 1890s, increasingly the United States and American public opinion is turning against certain groups of people. And he's more than happy to use that to his advantage to defend what the Ottoman state is doing to Armenian returnees. So he's clearly aware of this, of this shift that by the 1890s, it's not only concerned about Chinese immigration, but increasingly there is increasing concern about uh, Italians, Eastern European Jews, Lebanese, Armenians, and he's going to take advantage of that. And of course, it's that environment that later is going to raise these questions in the first couple of decades of the 20th century about where do these off white, if you will, uh, or not quite white groups fit in. And clearly very early on, Mavrayani Bay is aware that, um, that, that where the winds are, are blowing in terms of restrictionist politics in the United States. Um, so I'd say that that's, that's a big contribution of the book, especially is, 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 is kind of, uh, demonstrating and, and showing the prehistory that would then lead eventually to those court cases and these questions about where Armenians fit within this hierarchy of race. Uh, and then Tamano's question about where do they live and where do they settle? Um, so of course, famously, uh, the initial places of settlement are primarily industrial towns. So not major cities, but industrial towns on the outskirts of major Northeastern cities like Boston and New York. So initially, the largest numbers of people, especially Carpertsies, are ending up in places like Providence, uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, Fitchburg, Massachusetts, Worcester, of course, very famously. Um, and there's a book floating out there called Worcester is America, this idea that the Armenian colony of Worcester is what America is for many recently arriving Armenians. Um, but of course, you also have a small population of Armenians, and this is particularly Armenian Protestants from uh, Merzofan in, in, on the Black Sea coast or near the Black Sea coast. So a kind of different dynamic than what's, in, what's, what's causing Karpertsis to, to come to these, fabri uh, these uh, factory towns in the Northeast. Uh, and those, uh, especially Protestant Armenians are settling in Fresno, California. Uh, and that they kind of see the Fresno Armenian uh, colony, which is very different than uh, say the Armenian colonies in uh, in the Northeast in that it's much more agrarian. Um, and of course it becomes much more permanent because people are investing in land and they're settling there permanently. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit different dynamic with the Fresno Armenian community. Uh, there is a graduate student working under um, Huri Berberian at um, UC Irvine. I think his name is, um, I think his name is Bedros Tarosian. Um, who's doing some fantastic work that, that kind of connects Anusha's and Manu's questions. Uh, he's looking at um, specifically, um, I think he's looking at, especially at, at the Fresno Armenian press in the mm -hmm. 1890s, in the first decade of the 2000, or 2000, the 20th century, and um, looking at this question about how Armenian understandings of race are being reflected in these press discussions in the first couple decades of the 20th century. And I'm really excited um, to see his, um, his work evolve, because I think that that will begin to fill in many of the gaps um, that exist 
uh, surrounding the story of which there are many, many, many that remain to be filmed. Thank you so much. This is so fascinating. And I think we could go on forever. <laughs> but we are running out of time, unfortunately. So I couldn't get to everyone's questions. I apologize. Um, but uh, David, of course, has uh, a life outside of running webinars. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we're running out of time, unfortunately. But it's been such a great pleasure to have you uh, with us. And I hope that this is uh, only the beginning of many more conversations. Uh, Manu, for example, is working on transnational migration of science and physicians. Okay, so, uh, so you guys might have something to talk about uh, in the future. So I hope that that uh, conversation uh, will continue. And so thank you so very much, everyone, for coming. And thank you so very much, David, for facilitating this really great evening with us and, and your incredible book. And please go out and buy David's book. Yes, it's um, in paperback. It will be in paperback. It will be released at the end of this month. So you can pre-order it now. Much, much more accessible than the hard copy version, the hardback version. Yes, so thank you so very much. And uh, I hope that everyone is going to be joining us for our next event, which is on February 18th. And so please check our website for details. Thank you so very much and uh, a good evening to everyone. Good night, take care. And, and if, for those of you who are still on, if you'd like to email me any questions you have, I'd be happy to, to reach out if we didn't address your question uh, during the Q&A session. But thank you very much. Thank you to the Wonderful. organizers. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, David.